right, so next question is, how do you build a robust open source project? If there's anyone that's done it the most in the world, it's probably you. Mm, definitely not, but... What's the secret? Mm. What's the secret S ingredient to the special sauce? So I think for me, there's a thing that DHH said a few years ago, many years ago, that is sort of my guiding light on robust open source project, which is, he wrote a post called Why There Is No Rails Inc. Um, and Postgres wrote a similar post right when MySQL got bought, which was basically on the topic of why you can't own Postgres. And I think probably the number one thing that you can do for robustness in open source is to try to make sure there's not any one company that truly owns the project. There's not one company that has veto power over the direction of the project. There's not one company that can get bought or can decide to shut it down. Right. Um, so Rails, Postgres, Ember are all projects where the number people working on it are sufficiently um, spread out yeah. that there's it's hard to really... I think that in, that improves robustness in general is diversity of ownership. Um, well, you're, just, you're building kind of redundancy in. It's like any kind of like computer cluster. You don't want one server going down to bring down the whole cluster. Yep. And I think uh, some projects end up doing okay, but it's kind of hard to predict which projects will end up surviving. You can have well, like Cappuccino, for example, 280 North got acquired by Motorola, and then and like Batman like, JS ended up just got Shopify, Shopify just Shopify. said like, oh, we don't really care about the client side anymore. Yeah. We've switched back to the server, and now it's kind of abandoned largely because it was really owned conceptually by one company. So right. I think that for me is, is one of the key things. Um, well, I think, for example, like Angular 2.0, big rewrite, I think if we had gone into the Ember Core team and proposed that, we would have been laughed out of the room. Yes, we would have been beaten. <laughs> um, so, there, so that's one, I think, big aspect is making sure that there's a lot of people with a lot of different kinds of interests that are, that are running things. Um, and then another thing is, I think, this is something that takes a long time to get to a good center on, but trying to use worse is better adoption tactics, which basically means ship something small, simple, that people can latch on to. That's, good, very, that's, polished, that's, I think. that's quality. And then let the community sort of figure out how to iterate it towards, the, yeah. towards a good thing. But then on the flip side of that, don't just say, well, we have adoption now. Everything's great. Ship it. Game over. Yeah. Um, but to say well, we should try to iterate it towards high quality. Basically, don't treat adoption as the equivalent, high adoption as the equivalent of high quality. Right. I think a lot of people yeah. will make that mistake. I think a lot of people think, oh, this open source project just got really popular all of a sudden. It must be good. But if you don't, and it's not that it's bad. I think in, like people inside of the company, inside of the project do the same thing. People inside the project say, well, this was heavily adopted. I have many, many right. thousands of open source modules related to my project. That right. must mean that something that I did is the reason for the success. Right. And they're sort of attributing uh, to some some intention something that was usually in most cases luck. Well, luck, yeah. So the adoption kind of gives you the opportunity, but if you don't act on that luck, I think you open yourself up to vulnerability from the next person who's just a little bit incrementally better. Yep. You know, the adoption gives you uh, helps you kind of like raise an army, and you just got to point the army in the yep. in the so, right direction. So I think in general, it's like trying to use the worst is better adoption tactics to try to gain momentum. And I think in general, the fact that if you try to build something in the better is better approach by starting from the top down, you you definitely run into problems where you didn't really anticipate the whole story. You built something in ivory tower or just for your own product. Right. And then when you go out there into the world and try to get adoption, people say, this has nothing to do with what I need. No. So I think starting from something That's not small, just open source, though. It's also any product yeah, or any business. Literally, yeah. I think worse is better is a generalized theory of adoption. Yeah. <coughs> so in general, uh, the idea that you start from something small but reasonably good, and you, you get a community behind it, you get adoption, and then you use that to iterate towards a high-quality thing with the feedback from a large, diverse group of people, I think is, is the way to build a cool, good open source project. So one thing that you do that I've noticed that I personally really appreciate as a beneficiary of it is you will tend to find people who are maybe not really well known and you will kind of mentor them and give them feedback and kind of help raise their profile in the community like I know a lot of people on Rails Core now are people that you personally reached out to and and mentored so one how do you find time for that and two how do you know when someone is someone that you want to give that mentorship to so I I think there's a few things, but one of them is just do somebody really have the time to put into it? And somewhat interestingly, some of the best, some of the people who have had both the most time and been in the highest quality have actually been non-white American males, right? There, there's been a lot of people. 
I would say my, my, my favorite people are people like Santiago Pastorino or Joe Liss, right, who may not be of the typical profile that you would necessarily expect yeah. from, uh, from an open source contributor, um, people who really have a, a fire in their belly to, uh, to, to become higher profile, but also to do something cool to like yeah, change Yeah, they have things. this like burning desire to see things fixed. Yep. And, and I think you somehow, I don't know how you do it, but you somehow recognize this is a person that I know is, like, they want this thing so bad that I know they're going to be around for like, years. Yeah, I, I think it's basically people who, who I can see desire high-quality stuff. They desire good. They desire... Um, a lot of people get, like, to a middling level of quality, and they're like, ah, it's good enough. Yeah, and, but, but it's people who I think they have... Uh, for me, the high order bit is really: do you, is your is the thing that you want the most leverage? I think people right. who want leverage, and I don't mean that in a cynical way. I mean to impact the world. People, and I'm, now I'm getting into, <laughs> but people who who actually want to change the world, um, and and that doesn't mean like become president of the United States, uh, change right. it. You can change your little piece, but people who want to actually make some real change, yeah. I find I have a lot of uh, a lot of success working with them. I have some good theories on how to achieve leverage and, and push things forward, and people who are really interested in learning often teach me a lot. So, I think it's it's pretty interesting, kind of like watching you do this because it seems like you're always in it for the, the long term, the long game. Like I see stuff coming to fruition now that I remember seeing you plant the seeds for like three or four years ago, and that's always been usually in the form of mentorship. You know, someone. You have this kind of grand vision, I think, <laughs> of of like where you want web development to go, and there's so many pieces of that, and it seems like you accomplish that goal through this kind of like mentorship. Yeah, I think finding people who are interested. So first of all, it's important that the grand vision changes a lot over time. Right. I think it's easy to uh, ha you you can see clearly a vision, and then it turns out that a couple years later the context has shifted, and if you don't readjust, readjust you're going to yeah. be in trouble. Um, but yeah, find, there's some some things that are pretty timeless, and finding people who are gonna. Uh, so for example, Joe worked on broccoli. Yeah. I worked with her earlier. I like talked to her about uh, problems that I had with Grunt and other tools, and sort of gave her my spiel, my big picture yeah. idea on it. And I mean, she actually the thing she built was way better than what I <laughs> even had in yeah. mind. But just the general idea that like. The web, the ecosystem needs a tool which is good for incremental rebuilds, and here are some, here are some of the history behind that. Here are the constraints. Yeah, here, here are here's some of the constraints. And every tool that came out, like you know, Grunt was a great task runner, but it's not great at incremental builds. And Gulp has similar problems. Yeah, Gulp has some some issues. So basically, finding people that, yeah, you can plant the seed. Maybe they don't have time right now, but maybe yeah. at some point in the future. And, on, like I said, honestly, I almost all the people that I've worked the best with, I've learned tons, tons yeah. from because. Obviously, just being one person, you can form a model of the universe, but probably you only have so many empirical observations. And getting more and more people with broader and broader perspectives from a whole bunch of countries and contexts, um, you basically get to see a view of the world that's much broader. And I think, a, a kind of speaking of that, one of the principles that you've brought to Ember is you made it clear. So maybe probably a lot of people don't know this, but you made it clear from day one that in the core team, we have to value contributions other than code just as much. Yep. So code contributions, infrastructure contributions, docs contributions, those are all and like super running important. logistics, events, right. meetups, right? These are all things that so honestly like uh, Robert Jackson is way better than me at maintaining the Ember infrastructure. Like probably would have taken me many times longer than yep. it took him. Uh, Lay is way better than me at running yeah. EmberConf and, and helping people with local meetups. Trek is way better than me. Um, at doing long-term doc work and keeping it up to date and uh, learning. And from I think the really community. empathizing with users. Like, I think right. Trek really empathizes with people who get frustrated. Yep. So like these are all things that I, on a lot of other core teams I've seen that those people report to the code people. The code right. people are the masters of the universe, right. and then the people who do the other work are sort of second level peons, and they sort of report. But I what, what I usually find is that you have somebody that like oh I'm thinking about this EmberConf thing, and then you have a coder who's like has literally no idea how to do anything and now there's like this blockage there's yeah. all these problems so basically treating people who do things that are not other than code as first class citizens and and valuing their contribution at the level at which they deserve is something actually John Resig is the one who taught me this on the jQuery team and it's something that like moved me so much that it's something that I 
like I, like you said, I from day one on the Ember team, I okay, made it clear. Cool. All right, so we'll call this the Ycats Brand Unified Theory of Open Source. <laughs>